Welcome to episode 76 of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Ann Frost, and this episode was recorded on February 10th, 2022. I want to talk about a lot of things today, and the thing we are going to keep coming back to is crochet. I know some knitters are passionate about not crocheting, and I'm not going to try to convince you otherwise, but I do hope that maybe I can turn the heat down a little for some of you. And we also have lots of other things to talk about today, so stay with me. Let's get started. I'd like to welcome Jennifer, Pamela, and Yvonne as podcast producers since the last episode. They visited patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to make a monthly donation to the operating costs of the podcast. My patrons ensure that this project of mine pays for itself instead of coming out of the family budget, and I'm very grateful for that. Learn about the benefits you can receive as a patron by visiting patreon.com slash I thought I knew how. Another way to help the podcast is by leaving a five-star review and kind comments anywhere you listen to the podcast. Jane left a kind comment on Audible nearly a year ago, and I thank you for that, Jane. I don't know why it took me so long to check my reviews over there, and I'm sorry it took me so long to acknowledge that. I think I just get hyper-focused on Apple Podcasts and I forget about the other services, even though I don't actually use Apple Podcasts myself. What is wrong with me? The Great Yarn Challenge has been going on for a few weeks at this point. This is an event that is hosted by the Craft Yarn Council, which represents a lot of the big daddy crafting brands that are out there like Red Heart and Clover and Knitter's Pride. The event itself also has some sponsors like Barocco and Craftsy and others. And in keeping with my goal this year to consider knit alongs and other such events, if I already have the yarn in my stash, I decided to go stash diving and see what I could come up with. Now, over the last three years, either by using them up or by donating them to organizations, I have cleared almost all acrylics from my stash. I have one small cone of a pom-pom yarn that is 100% acrylic. I have some sock yarns that have some nylon. So I didn't actually expect to find the yarn I was going to need for this knit along because while they don't say you have to use their sponsor's yarn to win a prize in the event, I assumed it wouldn't hurt. And so many members of the Craft Yarn Council are acrylic heavy brands. My saving grace ended up being that Barocco was one of the sponsors of the event because I had enough yarn to make three of the six projects using Barocco yarn from my stash. I also found a kit that I'd bought from Craftsy back when Craftsy was still selling kits. I had one ball of kitchen cotton that is from one of the sponsors that was actually in a box destined to be rehomed that I pulled out to use for this instead. And then I had to buy three other skeins, which I figured was close enough to go ahead with the event. Week one, the prompt was to spruce up your space. The craftsy kit I had was to knit holiday trees by Yellow Cosmo. That's the actual name of the pattern, holiday trees. You've likely seen these yourself somewhere or have seen one like it because they have been very popular for five or six years now. They're cone-shaped trees, like imagine a gnome hat. They're either cable or color work. I added beads to each of the five trees in the pattern, some along the edge of the cable, some in between the cables. There were two colorwork cones. One was Norwegian stars with small patterns between them. And in that one, I just added a bead to the center of the stars and in the middle of each of the little patterns. The other colorwork cone had elk going around the base with single stitches here and there scattered around them to signify snow. So on that one, I added beads sort of randomly between the elk to increase the snow imagery. The patterns included instructions on how to create a paper cone for each to stand on. So you don't have to worry about your gauge. You just cast on a knit and afterwards you make a cone that fits what you knit and it's done. It's a very doable project for the first week. I was glad to have that prompt to actually get that kit on the needles because there have been at least two Christmases at this point that I've had that kit and not actually made them. For now, they're living on the craft table here in my office, half because I love them and half because I'm too lazy to take them up to the attic to put them away with the other decorations. (laughs) The second week's prompt was babies and fur babies. For that, I had enough Barocco weekend decay left over from a sweater I knit last year to make a baby blanket, but it was going to have to be crocheted. First of all, I did not have enough time to knit a baby blanket in a week. That wasn't going to happen. 
Also on Tuesday this week, I had jury duty and the information pamphlet for jurors specifically said no knitting needles. So I knew if I was going to lose a day sitting in a jury pool, I wasn't going to be able to knit a baby blanket. Crochet is simply faster. Unless you are a super speedy, spent your early days knitting for production, always knit with a needle supported in a belt or your armpit style knitter, crochet is simply faster. So I went digging and I came up with the Loopy Love Baby Blanket. It's double crochets and chain threes and the sample is done in three colors, but I had enough with just the one color to do it. The stitch pattern though had enough texture that I think it still looks great just in the one color instead of three different color stripes. The Weekend DK is a 50-50 blend of acrylic and cotton. It's machine washable, so great for a new mom. And I used up all but four yards of this yarn in the project by adding little tassels to the corners. And I have never been more proud of walking that line between using everything up and yarn chicken. I just, I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased with how this blankie turned out, and I will just say that if you are the person who gets this at your baby shower, you can know that I love the heck out of you because I think that this blanket is adorable. Patrons are going to get this before week three starts, so depending on when you're listening to this, week three either hasn't started or we are into week three already, which is yarn in the wild. My plan for this week is to crochet these little scrubbies I found using the kitchen cotton I already have and a ball of scrubby cotton from Red Heart. The scrubby cotton is one of the yarns I bought, and it's maybe a sport weight cotton with strands of twisted cotton coming off the main yarn. And I can't help but think that the fact that this yarn exists is probably due to customer demand because Red Heart has had their scrubby yarn for a while now, and it's 100% polyester. And it was released for crafters to make scrubbies with, like scrub at your kitchen sink, clean and dishes. I don't know, but I think it's safe to assume that some customers out there requested that they come up with a cotton version so they weren't having to use the plastic version. Or maybe Red Heart saw the writing on the wall. I don't know. But the fact that scrubby cotton exists made me very happy. It is 100% cotton, and when it's crocheted up, it looks like a towel. The strands of the twisted cotton mostly end up tucked into the stitches. So yeah, this finished scrubby looks like towel fabric. My plan is to make up as many of these little scrubbies as I can with the two yarns I have and give them to my youngest to hold on to to use in her apartment when she heads to college next year. I'm not tearing up, you are. Not that I'm shooing her out the door by any means, but I have started thinking about what sorts of things I can start making for her now to take with her to have a touch of home. And these little scrubbies are about five inches across and she can choose to use them as washcloths or makeup removers or even as dishcloths if she wants to. And in the meantime, they are daisy shaped. So I'll be able to take them outside to photograph and qualify for the yarn in the wild prompt. Week four is Just Wear It, and I have a pattern for a Barocco capelet that I found that will use Barocco Mantra yarn, which is a raw silk. It's sport weight, and I actually won it as a daily prize from Knit New Haven the first year that I did the I-91 Shop Hop, so I'm very excited to get to use that. That project will be knit, and I'm a little nervous about getting that done in time. We will see. And also as a broad-shouldered lady, I do not know that the finished capelet will actually fit me properly. But I have been wanting to knit that pattern with that yarn for a while now. So if it doesn't suit me when it's done, I'll find a friend to gift it to. I am totally, I'm going into it thinking that already. So if it fits me, that'll be a nice bonus. Week five is to stitch your state. You knit or crochet an Afghan square with your state on it to send to Warm Up America to be made into Afghans for charity. I live in Connecticut, which is basically a rectangle with a crooked bottom. So this is not going to be difficult for me to make. This is the other project I had to buy the yarn for, though, because I wanted to make the square in our state colors. And I also wanted it to be machine washable because I know it's going to a charity project. I did not have the right colors and the right kind of yarn. 
Our state, actually, I found out, does not have official colors, but we do have a white and blue flag. So that's what I went with. The sample blocks that they have pictures of on the website for the Great Yarn Challenge have a lot of surface embroidery where people add like the state symbols and mark where the capital is. And so I'm going to try and do some of that. I'm going to probably do a bear because Connecticut has a policy of just tagging and allowing bears to be, which means that uh, where I live anyway, uh, we've had bears in our yard several times. Our town actually has quite a few bears popping up on the, the Facebook group. And then we're just like, you just see bears in Connecticut. So a bear definitely has to go on there. We're also called the nutmeggers. <laughs> it's one of our nicknames for the people from our state. So I'm going to put a nutmeg seed. There's a little controversy about why we're called the nutmeggers whether people were actually importing nutmeg or if people were carving wood to look like nutmeg seeds and selling those as nutmeg seeds. It's controversial. Anyway, we're known as the nutmeggers. (laughs) So I'm going to try and do a little nutmeg seed on there and maybe like a whale off the coast or something. I haven't figured that all out. The important thing is that I don't embroider. So I'm planning on crocheting my block so I can get it done quickly. And then that will give me more time to sort of figure out the embroidery. If you see it pop up on my Instagram and it's just a plain block that looks like Connecticut on it, then you'll know the embroidery did not work out. Uh, And finally, week six is to stitch it forward. And they want you to teach someone how to do a fiber craft. I have already started working on this week, enlisting my daughter's friend to come over to learn how to crochet from me. And that is going well. They are using a bulky yarn to do a double crochet scarf and are nearing completion. I'm using Barocco Quechua for the project I was working on at the same time to demonstrate stitches as I was teaching my daughter's friend. Unfortunately, this yarn has been discontinued. It is delicious. It is a sport weight, 60% merino, 20% baby alpaca, 20% yak yarn. And I love it. I love it. Originally, I started out with the same number of chain stitches and was making, as a result, a very thin scarf while my student was working with Bulky, but I decided that the yarn was too yummy to end up dangling down my front as a long skinny scarf, so I pulled it all out. I restarted it as a cowl, so as much of it as possible will remain in contact with my skin. I love this yarn. It was the only hank I had, and they don't make it anymore. So if you see it out there, Barocco Quechua, pick some up. It is lovely stuff. So there you go. You have been totally spoiled about what my Great Yarn Challenge projects are going to be. And if you were keeping score, you will notice that four of the projects I chose are crocheted or will be crocheted, partly for speed, partly for ease, and partly because it's easier for a lot of folks to learn for crochet. So that's why week six, I was so happy when my daughter's friend opted for crochet instead of knitting. It's so much easier to teach. That's my experience. I'm biased, I will admit. I'm going to make a case for crochet after we have a music break. This is Pardon from Humans Win. Pick up your knitting or your crochet if you haven't already, and I'll see you on the other side.
Okay, let's talk crochet. Crochet as we know it today is a much later development than knitting. It likely did not exist before the early 1800s, though its exact emergence and who came up with it is lost to time at this point. The name is French and means little hook, which makes sense because rather than using two sticks, crochet uses one hook. There were other crafts around that used hooks in the past, including both knoll binding and knitting at one point, but crochet is its own entity with its own method and stitches. Crochet and knitting can be used to create many of the same types of fabric. Cables, color work, and lace can all be produced in crochet. Crochet is often thought of as knitting's simpler cousin, and I think that's unfair. It can be easier to learn crochet before learning to knit because generally speaking, you completely finish off each stitch before moving on to the next one. Meaning that if your hook gets pulled out of a crochet project, the stitches don't tend to go anywhere. As long as you don't pull on the yarn, the live loop will generally just wait for you to put the hook back into it no matter what material you are crocheting with. With knitting, having the needles pulled out can result in disaster depending on the type of fiber you are working with. That said, the patterns and stitches involved with crochet can be very complicated, and some of the more advanced patterns are enough to make a beginner's head spin. So do not fall into the trap of believing that crochet is easy peasy. Losing your tool while working on knitted lace would be a nightmare, but the stitches involved with knitting lace are not terribly complicated in and of themselves. Losing your tool while crocheting lace wouldn't bring widespread devastation, but the manipulation of the stitches themselves is arguably more complicated. So it's really pick your poison. Just as knitting is a series of interlocking loops, crochet is as well. Only with crochet, a stitch is a series of loops that interlock with each other as well as the fabric below. As I talk about crochet, I'm going to be using American terminology, so apologies to those who learned the British terms. They are different. They are the same terms often used different ways. So I I do apologize for any confusion with British listeners as I go through what I'm about to go through. Uh, A chain is a single loop that is attached to the fabric below it. A slip stitch is a single loop that is attached to the fabric at both the bottom and the top of the stitch. A single crochet is two loops connected to the previous stitch and the fabric below it. A double crochet is roughly twice as tall as a single crochet and involves a series of four interlocking loops. For you hardcore crocheters, I really wanna say five interlocking loops, but I feel like the last one is really the first loop for the next stitch, so I'm going with four, but I'm willing to accept that there's more than one way to count the loops involved. When you work one of these standard stitches back and forth in rows, you end up with very distinctive lines running across the fabric, which is one of the complaints people tend to have about the look of crocheted fabric. However, by using the stitches in various combinations, you can alter the overall texture of the fabric to appear smoother, to have a more random texture, to add baubles or holes, or to even mimic three-dimensional forms. With knitting, the loops tend to lay flat so that someone looking at the surface of the fabric could poke through the hole from front to back. With crochet, the loops tend to face sideways or up and down so that the hole formed by the loop is turned on its side. This, plus the fact that the stitches require more loops, means that crocheted fabric is thicker than knitting when worked on the same diameter tool. So in other words, a 5 millimeter crochet hook will produce thicker fabric than a 5 millimeter knitting needle. This has led to one of the common criticisms of crochet, that it's too bulky and stiff. And this is a completely unfair assessment of crochet that is very easily overcome by simply increasing the size of the hook. Crocheted fabric can drape just as well as knitting if the right fiber, stitch, and hook combination is used. Unfortunately. Some yarn companies are rather lazy with their yarn labels and recommend the same sized hook as their knitting needle on the gauge square. And novices don't realize that an ideal drape can easily be achieved by going a size or two higher with their hook. Of course, one of the perks of crochet is that it can be used to create very stiff fabrics. This is especially helpful for creating things like baskets, toys, and art forms that need to be able to hold a shape without additional support. 
Trying to knit an extremely tight cloth can be next to impossible because it can get so difficult to fit two knitting needles in a live loop and still get a stitch tight enough to hold itself up without support. Crochet stitches only require one tool to be able to squeeze into a stitch, so they can be worked much more firmly. Knitters should have more than a cursory knowledge of crochet. There are two forms of provisional cast-on that require a rudimentary knowledge of crochet, as well as a method to reinforce steaks before cutting. But aside from that, crochet can complement our knits. Pairing, knitting, and crochet allows you a larger scope for the imagination. It's not uncommon to see tops with knitted lace panels or edgings worked in crochet. Calls for charity items can be answered faster and more generously when crocheted because once you are past the learning stage, it is much faster than knitting. Not to mention that there are legitimately beautiful crochet projects out there that you might want to make. Sophie's Universe is an absolute stunner of a blanket. The Alma sweater looks like traveling brioche without having to knit traveling brioche. And let's not even get started on the possibilities with Amigurumi. Crochet yourself a carrot with an adorable face? Why not? Want a baby Yoda made of yarn? It's yours. Indeed, many people take up crochet way before they have any interest in knitting because they want to make their own amigurumi. If you are a continental knitter who holds the yarn in your left hand, you already basically have the stance you need to crochet. Drop the left hand needle and replace your right hand needle with a hook. English style knitters may need more practice to get used to holding the working yarn in your left hand, but it's not impossible to learn. Have patience with yourself. There are excellent tutorials on YouTube to get you started for free or pop into your local yarn store and ask for a class. If the yarn store owner turns white and starts to stammer, maybe try a different yarn shop. It's getting more and more rare, but there are still yarn store owners out there who do not know how to crochet. Craftsy has excellent classes to get you going on crochet or just ask around. If there's any group of people more eager to share their craft than knitters, it's crocheters. I bet you could find someone to get you started. I was talking to someone the other day who mentioned that her local yarn store was over two hours away. That is just wrong. Make one of my local yarn stores your local yarn store. Knit New Haven offers yarn and tools online as well as classes and knitting groups. Check them out at knitnewhaven.com. Do you need more than pre-recorded videos to help you with your knitting projects? Check out the Morehouse Merino Flock. New knit-alongs go live all the time, and Erin provides Flock members with online open hours to get their knitting questions answered for any project, not just current or previous knit-alongs. Any project. Learn more at morehousemerinoflock.com. Wellex has wool clothing for you or your partner from underwear to outerwear, tees, leggings, polo shirts, hoodies, and more. Use the link in the show notes to have a look and enter your email address in the pop-up box when you get to the site and you'll get a coupon for $20 off your order. Wellex is one of my trusted brands for wool and wool blend clothing. Find the link in the show notes. I am officially designing again. I say again because I used to design crochet projects all the time. One of the things I love about crochet is that if something's not working, it's really easy to rip back to where it was working and do it again. Crochet is far more conducive to design, I think. Ripping out bits that don't work always felt like exuberant finger painting. Oh, that slosh of paint didn't work there. Let's scoop it off, mix it with something else, or grab a new sheet of paper and start again. I used to design one-off items for myself or my kids all the time, and then I started to actually write up the patterns to submit to Crochet Me when it was an independent entity. At one point, I had an agreement to design three home decor patterns for a book with an actual publisher. I arranged for yarn support, I wrote up the patterns, and I mailed the finished items to the publisher to be photographed. And then I got them all back several months later because too many of the other designers involved with the project had backed out. So they canceled the book. 
And that is when I stopped designing, partly because after all the excitement about being picked up for a book, losing that opportunity because other people dropped the ball was quite a blow. This was before Ravelry and other one-stop shopping sites for paid patterns. I could go on designing for Crochet Me, but there was no pay involved there other than the dreaded exposure. But also, my youngest was getting more mobile, and then we moved abroad, and I didn't release another pattern. Fast forward, oh, 10, 15 years later, People are used to buying patterns online. There are multiple sites providing a marketplace for independent designers. And I have had two patterns swimming around in my brain. One has been in there for nearly three years now, and the other has been around since September. Either one, I could sit down and knit in less than a week. But they keep swimming around in my brain because I know I want to put them down on paper. I want them to be patterns. Neither of them are earth-shattering designs, though one I think is funny, and the other is a modern twist on an old style. It's not the creation of the project that I fear. It's not that I don't want anyone else to have one like mine. When you write a pattern, you are, by definition, inviting others to follow you. You are laying out a plan for them, and when you do that, you have to be perfect. I can hear some of you now. Oh, Anne, you don't have to be perfect. Patterns have errors here and there all the time. Digital patterns allow you to correct them quickly and move on. It's not a big deal. And to you, I say, thank you. You are not the people I fear. (laughs) I fear the ones who see an imperfection and a switch flips in their brain and they want you to drop everything and fix it and apologize on your knees for the error and never dare to be imperfect again. And I fear the people who see the way I've done something and feel the need to explain in great detail why they would have done it another superior way and then wait for me to thank them profusely and alter the pattern to their specifications. And I fear finding out that so-and-so is friends with this other person And that person's design is so similar to my own that clearly I've stolen it, never mind the fact that I've never heard of the other person or seen their design. And I fear the people who think that because I released a pattern, it means I have the time to explain every step to them one-on-one with videos and FaceTimes and long email explanations. And if I don't, it's because I'm selfish and standoffish and rude. You may think that I'm overstating things, that my concerns are overblown and unfounded, but in the era of the internet, I have already experienced some of those things for myself, or my dear friends who design have experienced them, some of them ending up in tears for days and fearing for their livelihood because someone or some small group of people took their pattern as an invitation to a party that does not exist. And even voicing these worries has me worried, but here I am. Here I have been. I stopped designing over a decade ago, and I have let new designs swim around in my brain for years because these worries have been standing guard, keeping me from being vulnerable in a way as mundane as writing instructions on a piece of paper or typing them in a Google Doc. You know what I mean. A few weeks ago, it was Face the Music Monday again, and I didn't have an unfinished object that was languishing that I could work on. That is actually completely untrue. I have two. One is a lace scarf that I've lost the pattern to, and the other is my Strom cardigan, but I'm actively ignoring both of them. Rather than working on one of my unfinished projects, I decided I was going to face the ultimate music and start working on one of my designs. I got the yarn out, I got the needles, I cast on, And I immediately realized I needed three more colors. (laughs) I was tempted to give up for the day, but I got the yarn ordered and decided to focus on getting all the introductory stuff written for the pattern, yarn types and colors, material lists, a description of the pattern, first steps. I got out my colored pencils and I worked out the color placement. I spent three hours working on it, doing as much as I could without the yarn I needed, and then I set it aside. The seal on the pattern writing process had been broken. I was underway again, and it felt good. Before Monday rolled around again, the yarn I needed had arrived, so I carried on that next Face the Music Monday and got through the first two inches of the project. 
I was cooking with gas. Then I did a double color change and discovered that the two colors that had been dancing around in perfect step in my brain for months looked awful together in the project. And if they didn't look good together, it actually necessitated pulling all my work out to the first row and starting over. So I did. And I didn't cringe at all because at this point, it's just me. And I know I'm figuring things out and I know I'm going to make mistakes, but that I can fix them. And I know this is the best way I know to do things and that it's my idea and I want to get it out properly and that I can take the time now to get it the best it can be without worrying about anyone else. It didn't feel like defeat. It felt like I was three years old again, sitting on my bedroom floor, finger painting with giant globs of paint clinging to the tops and sides of my fingers. And I didn't like how the trees were turning out. So I just grabbed another piece of construction paper and scooped out some new paint and started again. Creative abandon. No one told me I was wrong. I saw it wasn't right. I did it again because I wanted to, not because I was being critiqued or criticized or instructed. It's been a very, very long time since I felt that way. I have been working from patterns for so long. At some point, the creative abandon will stop. I will have something I love that made my heart sing for weeks while I worked on it. And then I will put it out there for others. And I'll take my chair to the corner and I'll watch as people take it. And I'll hope that no one comes and turns my chair to the wall. To my designing friends, I ask, does this ever get easier? Will I always be this neurotic? Those are perhaps two very different questions. And maybe you shouldn't answer the second one. Let's have a song before we wrap things up. This is another by Humans Win. Humans Win is a songwriter by the name of Lance Conrad, and he'll use different singers for his songs, but this one appears to be the same as Pardon from earlier in the show. It's definitely got a more dramatic sound, though. This song is This Is Not All. Give or not Grasping 
a few more things before I go. I have details for you about the Knit Along coming up in March that will be running with Jana of the Knit Together podcast over on YouTube. We will be knitting a cowl called the Hap Cowl designed by Ella Gordon. Those who are familiar with Shetland Haps can picture the garter stitch center square surrounded on four sides by undulating rows of feather and fan stitch, typically knit in alternating colors to supplement the look of the lace. These large haps would have been folded on the diagonal and worn over your shoulders, crossed in the front, and secured by tucking into a waistband or a belt. The hap cowl looks like one side of the hap. The top of the cowl is several inches of garter stitch, and the bottom is a stripy feather and fan. The original design is knit using Jameson and Smith jumper weight wool, which is a fingering. I have picked out some Uradale Farm jumper weight for mine, And Jana is poking through her stash of sock yarns for her colors. We will be releasing a video on February 15th on the Pearl Together channel with some more details, so look for that. We will start by casting on a swatch on March 1st, and we will plan to block our cowls by March 31st, but you are welcome to take however long you want. Jana will be producing how-to videos along the way that will go live every week, and the two of us will have progress video podcasts as well. Be sure you are subscribed to the Pearl Together YouTube channel so you don't miss any of those, and check the show notes for links to the pattern so you can start thinking about your color choices. If you want to use the original yarn or another Shetland yarn, I did just place an order uh, two weeks ago, and it arrived within a week. So dare I say that shipping seems to be back to normal? If you want to play it a little more carefully, there are plenty of stockists of Shetland wool around the world. Just check the website for the company you want to work with, look for their list of stockists, and see if there's one in your country. Erin Pirro and I were able to get together and film another episode of That Knitting Show. That is up now on the That Knitting Show YouTube channel. Look for that and subscribe while you are getting yourself ready for the knit along. That is all for this time, my friends. I will see you in a few weeks. In the meantime, Thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to make a monthly pledge. You may also consider making a purchase from one of our sponsors by visiting the website I thought I knew how.com and clicking the link at the top that says be a booster. While you are on the site, you can also find the show notes for each episode. Thank you ever so much to my patrons, to Knit New Haven and to Morehouse Farm for sponsoring the podcast. Find me on my social media accounts as I thought I knew how, except on Twitter, where it's just thought I knew how. The groups on various platforms are all called I Thought I Knew How Podcast. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joins, and plenty of time to knit. Knit.